All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for our very first virtual Mr. Free show. Uh, please use the Q&A button to submit questions, and we will take a break about halfway through to ask questions of Mr. Freeze, and if time allows, another chance to ask questions at the end. Uh, my name is Amanda Early, and I work in the Office of uh, Education and Public Engagement at Fermilab, and I will be your moderator for this event. And with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Jerry Zimmerman, Fermilab's Mr. Freeze, to introduce himself. Am I out? Yep. Yep. Okay. I don't see me. Okay. Um, this is Jerry Zerman, alias Mr. Freeze of Fermi Lab. And I'm here to introduce the video you're about to see. It's uh, since we're on a virtual type thing, I normally do the show live uh, for the open house, but this is virtual. So it is a, a video that was shot a couple of years ago at IIT for their STEM Expo. And it's a good case to see basically what the show involves and some fun science about cryogenics and liquid nitrogen. So uh, I will uh, let you sit back, relax, watch the video, and I'll be showing you a little bit of specialty uh, cryogenic science at the very end of this demonstration to pique your interest just a little bit more. So with that, let us go ahead and roll in the video. And everyone, you could see that? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, um, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, a couple things before I begin. Uh, first off, I'm not Mr. Freeze, okay? My real name is Jerry Zerman. I am a physicist at Fermi Lab. Uh, Fermi Lab is a national lab run by Department of Energy. We do a particular type of science called high energy physics, particle physics. Uh, as I said, I'm a physicist there, and if you've ever seen the Big Bang Theory, okay, I'm more of a Leonard Hosteller, sort of a Sheldon Cooper type physicist. What's up? I don't ever really have girlfriends, so it's kind of fun. So the area of science that I work in in particular is called cryogenics. Now, kids, cryogenics is not the science of crying. There'll be no crying during the demonstration. But it is the science of the extreme cold, thus my nickname, Mr. Freeze. Before I start forcing around, I always like give you a chance to see what I'm working with. We sometimes refer to this stuff as liquid air, but typically it's only a portion of the air. This is liquid nitrogen. That's it. It's just a clear liquid. In fact, if you didn't know that, you could actually very easily mistake that stuff for water. Now, there's a few things that we notice right off the bat, so these seem a little different. Uh, first of all, what's the stuff coming up here? Steam pot, what's this stuff? Fog, it's water vapor, just like you see a breath of winter. Same effect, only this is caused by the fact that the liquid in the bag is so cold that it's condensed into water vapor out of the air around it. What's happening to the liquid in the bag? Bubbling. Bubbling because it's boiling. It's boiling because everything's so hot that it's that everything makes it blow. My glove is so hot to that liquid that my glove makes that liquid blow. Just like electric arm makes water boil, my glove makes that liquid blow. Well, here's where it helped me out. If you want to know something, what do you have to do but ask the question? As I go through the show, I'm a regular go like this. What I want you to do is ask me the question, how cold is it? So let's give that a try. How cold is it? It's so cold, it makes a snowman shiver. How cold is it? It's so cold, it turns Smurfs blue. How cold is it? It's so cold, it thought the Arctic uh, vortex was a heat wave. What you actually need to know the temperature of something is a thermometer, and I have a thermometer here, about 70 in here, very nice. But I actually pour this liquid on my thermometer, so I actually measure the temperature. So I pour this liquid right on my thermometer like that. So measure the temperature of the liquid really at. So uh, liquid nitrogen is about uh, 45 degrees. No, what happened? I broke, I didn't break my thermometer. The thermometer's working just fine, but it's actually measuring is minus 320 degrees. That's how cold this liquid is in these containers. And because it is so cold, it has a very powerful effect on lots of things. Now, one of the first things that we noticed was that the liquid is boiling. Now, when you boil water, you get steam. This is the water, the nitrogen. So what do you when I boil nitrogen? Nitrogen gas, or basically air. So put a little bag, seal the bag up. What will happen is that bag will fill with nitrogen gas caused by the leak side expanding and inflating that bag. See, so it makes lots of gas. Oh. 
I guess this bag really wasn't big enough for this job, so I'm probably going to need a uh, bigger bag here. Oh, actually, uh, before I continue, I am going to need a little help with some math. So I'm going to give everybody a little mental math exercise. It's a very simple problem. Should be able to figure this out real easily. Now, I need to know how many seconds are, okay, seconds in a year. Second. It's really easy. It's 12. Yeah, January 2nd, February 2nd, March 2nd, April 2nd. I thought about those other seconds. Oh, no, no. I thought you sleep here and had a second for no good reason. And, okay. So I got a bigger bag here. Now, one of the things I'm going to be doing as I do this demonstration is scientific investigation. And investigation is what we call the expansion rate. So basically, how much gas do you get from a given amount of liquid? If I start with, say, one cup of liquid, how many cups of gas will you get? Well, the way to find out of course, is you take one cup of liquid, you put it in your bag, you seal your bag up, and you'll see how many cups of gas you get for each one cup of liquid. Now, this is a good-sized bag. got lots of cups of gas. I'm trying to use this table here as a hot plate warming it up for me here. Yeah, he's cooking in there. So, so what do you think? Is that bag gonna be big enough? So one cup of liquid convert a gas. No. So tell me, what do you do when you have a little scientific setback? Do you give up? Do you quit? No. Oh, you buy a bigger bag. So I have a bigger bag, and I repeat my experiment. Start with one cup of liquid again into the bag. Now, the good thing about this bag is that I know this bag is, in fact, a 45-gallon trash bag. This bag here holds 45 gallons. But wait a second. I don't need to know how many gallons of gas I get. I need to know how many cups, because I'm trying to make a ratio of cups to cups. So I guess I need to know how many cups are in 45 gallons. Right, first, I need to know how many cups are in one gallon. So how many cups are in a gallon? 16 cups in a gallon. 45 gallons in the bag. Okay, 16 times 45. That's a little trick here. So is this bag going to be big enough? So one cup of liquid converted to gas. 16 times 45. Going once. You better hurry up. 16 times 45. Going once. And the question. Is this bag big enough? So one cup of liquid converted to gas. 16 times 45. And the answer is yes. In fact, this bag is just big enough. So one cup of liquid for gas, the maximum number for each one cup of liquid you get 700 cups of gas. By the way, 16 times 45 is 720, so this bag is just big. Now that's fine, but the truth is that's not very convenient. It would be much better if I actually uh, bit much better if I actually had a container I could hold it in. Now because I am kind of the uh, clumsy sort here, I have to make sure I put a cork on that so I don't spill any of it. Is there a problem? Oh. <laughs> okay, that's what happened. Okay, okay. Uh, actually, this is kind of a neat way to demonstrate another principle of science. Is that if I kind of turn things around a bit and do it this way? <laughs> so. What principle of science is I trying to demonstrate here? Rocket propulsion. The reason why the bottle flies away because it is just like a rocket that cork comes up. But the truth is, that's still really not what we do. What we really do, this. What happens in this case? The bottle blows up. Yeah, in fact, I know somebody referred to that. They did this demonstration and the bottle blew up. He had broke his nose. Good seats in front, right? I thought you said something about being really brave. And all that. By the way, it doesn't have some sort of nose radar. It could hit you anywhere. What do you say? Why would somebody knowing the bottle's going to blow up be standing here holding it? See, one of these about working in science is understanding how to handle it safely. Not even let this bottle from blowing up. You fuck a hose away! By the way, Bazinga. <laughs> At the end of the demonstration, it'll actually be detonating when he's about to see how powerful it really is. It is quite dramatic. Okay, we investigated the gas expanding. Now we're going to investigate what happens when you introduce the gas into it. What's going to happen to a balloon? It's going to pop. It's going to freeze. What's the frozen balloon like? Find out. Put it in here. Oh, 
Oh, this is this is quite interesting. Yeah, it's going to change colors. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. No, it's going to change. No, that's not it. Okay, wait a second. There seems to be a problem here. Is that that? Okay, wait a second. How about uh? No, no. Okay, is that that? That's not it. Uh, is uh? Is it uh? No, no. How about uh? No, that's not it. Is it uh, this uh, yeah? No, no, okay, uh, how about uh, no, no, no. Is it uh, uh, uh what color is that board of seven here? Yellow, there, oh, there it is. The air inside those balloons collapses that 700 times. Once you bring the balloons out, the air inside warms back up, re expanding, re inflating to the same shape size we before it started. That's the reason why all these balloons are up inside the Oh, by the way, in sort of an odd timing thing, um, I recently got done working on an experiment with Fringley, and this is the truth, okay? The name of that experiment is called the dark side. I was working for the dark side. <laughs> it's actually a project detector in Italy. If you want to Google that, you need to Google dark side 50, otherwise you'll never find it in a million years. But when I was asked to join that experiment, I was told it was going to require some long hours, some weekends. And I said, okay, if I join your experiment, what do I get out of it? You know what they said? They said, give me a lightsaber. I was expecting something other than a very, very lightsaber. By the way, I don't think these are very dangerous. I'm no big deal in the movie. Is. You can't hurt anybody with this thing, right? By the way, this is good for something. Very good at making cold cuts. By the way, you do know what this is, right? It's a special type of puppy dog. No. It's a... Chili dog! <laughs> Chili dog. Yeah. I was, I was going to use um, this balloon here. Oh, it doesn't fit. Oh, wait a second. What if I help it along? As the air inside that balloon cools down, you collapse. Remember from the movie right by now, she's saying, Dorothy, you wicked little girl. As the air inside that balloon cools down, it collapses in my head. What about a more rigid, a more rigid bed with an empty bottle, with regular cap? How about an even more rigid bed? It's an empty can. I sealed the top with tape, so basically it's just a little balloon. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this. Um, what happened to the balloon when I brought it back out? It reinflated, it came back exact same shape and size. A plastic bottle on my hands here, warmed it up. Plastic bottle, there we go. Comes back. Aluminum can. Does not. There's a reason for that. Some materials are permanently affected by cold temperature. In this case, aluminum. Oh. The, alu the aluminum. Actually becomes a stronger material. It's actually called cryo treatment. Very standard machine industry nowadays to cryo treat your metal to make it stronger or whatever for certain applications. So if you ever see on that a uh, cryo treated on a product, that's basically what they did is dip it in the ice and make it stronger. Whatever. Um, you'll notice when I'm working up here, it does kind of look like I'm reaching in these containers, and I can actually see where the liquid inside container is. Um, I have different things for different jobs. I had these blue gloves. These are special trial handling gloves because I can handle extremely cold things. I have the dogs. Very good for like getting balloons in and out of their neck and hair. But you think the hazard of this stuff is that you wouldn't want to get on your skin. So you'd wear some type of protective gear to protect your skin from contact. Now this black glove from that this is a special glove. It's been guaranteed tested liquid type. So no liquid can get through this glove out of my hand. So this glove's perfect for me like you know, reach in, grab something. Is this a bad idea? Yeah. I mean, what's going to happen? Like, figure this is going to fuck off? Uh, 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 no, I didn't actually lose anything. Either. But this glove isn't very good at working in cryogenics because this glove itself changes into something that's, in fact, much more like glass. In fact, why do you think I'm wearing this white glove? Because of the cold temperatures? No, because why does that glass? What would happen to my hand? I cut my hand. Do you know how hard it is to explain to people how you cut your hand on a rubber glove? 
<laughs> so anyway, anyway, anyway. But what would really happen if I put my hand in there? If I put my hand in there for a few seconds, I would get on my hand with all the fire burn. Very similar to a fire burn, and the body feels the odds going on. In fact, a few minutes later, all the skin would peel off my hand. Because it burned the skin off the hand, so anyway, start going to fire. Actually, my hand in there for about five minutes, it looked pretty solid. Now, as compared to those TV shows, movies, things you do not shatter like glass, that's not the way the body is. The bone stay about as strong as you have now. But having said that, what the world do I think of? Oh, man. Why can I not put my hand clean in there? And I can hold my hand here. I can kind of demonstrate that with this. I have here, get out of here in a bit, a crack. I crack, and I have it to demonstrate a property of material, or uh, the back of this. What happens when I pour this liquid on this crack? The reason why that goes running across that track that way is the same reason why. Bag right over here. Okay. What happens when I pour it on the table here? It goes running off the far side of the table. The reason it's running across the table that way is the same reason why I can hold it in my hand. See, if I was using a different liquid, let's say I was using water, and poured water on my hand, what did my hand get? What did the floor get? That's not wet. That's not wet. So what happened here? That liquid did not touch the floor. Did not touch my hand. My hand, of course, so hot that it's boiling before it reaches the surface for under a gas. That can cause the linden frost or lighten frost effect, depending right on who you talk to. And the surface of the thing is so hot that it's boiling before it reaches the surface for under the air gas for some time. See, the real hazard is not your skin. The real hazard is something that can actually absorb a liquid. This cloth is wet with nitrogen. That cloth against your skin. You transfer the cold temperature, giving you a burn. You ever go to a doctor and get a warp for enough, which is a cotton cloth, a two tip to transfer that cold temperature to kill whatever you're trying to get rid of. And I quite often get asked, by the way, a little background information. Fermi Lab allows me a couple of days of my work schedule to go to area schools to do this demonstration to promote science in the classroom. That's the reason I'm Mr. Freeze. Uh, after hours weekends like this, they have volunteer my time for. But I quite often get asked whenever I do a demonstration at school, can I do that? And if you know this, okay, when I do this, I'm very careful not to cross it where I get on somebody else. Or toss it or get on myself. So the only way to actually teach somebody how to handle a knife is what? Is if everybody in the area is naked. See, if you weren't wearing any clothing right now, this would be a perfectly safe demonstration, right? Oh, wait a second, wait a second. There's something else on your body absorbs liquid in there. There, yeah, see what happened to me? No, there's nothing to do with worrying about it. This here is pretty neat stuff. This here. Is a four liter door for LD. Now, four liters is about uh, how much in US terms? It's about a gallon of liquid nitrogen. How much do you think a gallon of liquid nitrogen costs? Is it like, you know, five bucks a gallon? Ten bucks a gallon? Twenty? Try one dollar a gallon. In fact, in really large quantities, like we get a burn head, we get liquid nitrogen for 25 cents a gallon delivered. So, why is it so cheap? First of all, where do you get it from? There, all of that nice time flowing around here is going in the air. You're breathing all in. These little guys breathe all back out again. It's just recyclable. By the way, this is government nitrogen. I do have to take accounting for every so please keep track of all your breaths so I can keep track of how many nitrogen is going in and out here. Uh, secondly, what we really need out of the air? Oxygen. Liquid oxygen much more valuable, much more commodity. Nitrogen is just a byproduct. That's a good thing it is so cheap. We do use a lot of it there for a minute. Ever seen those big trucks? Each one of those trucks holds 7,000 gallons. We use two of those trucks every day. But you know a company that uses more than we do. You've been, you've eaten your stuff frozen in the night. They probably should put a sign on the door right next to the clown's face. Yeah, Ronald McDonald used the night freeze that hand drink weight last week. Ever wonder why it looks the way it does? I know. That's all I'm at. Okay, first off, it's 25 cents a gallon. You feed a lot of hand drink 25 cents. Secondly, it's just nitrogen. You can dump a truckload of directly on the food, and it will not affect the quality or safety of the food. And the third reason the McDonald's Corporation does it, I can demonstrate this way. Put some water in this bag, and I'm going to add some liquid nitrogen. I was trying to keep the demonstration myself. I have in this bag two liquids. One liquid is boiling, while one liquid is freezing. One liquid is going from a liquid to a gas at the exact same. So which one is boiling? 
Nitrogen, that's right. Which one's freezing? What am I making? Ice. By the way? Ice. Ice. It's so cold, it makes ice scream. Oh, that came out wrong. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Not the uh, uh, screaming ice. We just turn around the other way. There we go. Okay. Now, this ice I am making here is regular standard water ice. Uh, very odd shape to the way it was formed. It also has the property, you get a little small piece, this ice is so cold, this ice, there you go, freezes to my skin. It's so far below 32 that it freezes to me before I melt it. Same idea as you're trying to milk like foam in the winter. Don't do that, it really works. If you want proof, I'll show you the movie again. And again, and again. But whatever, I try to eat that ice. It freezes to my tongue, you're pretty painful, yeah. So what in the world would I be thinking of with a marshmallow! Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, you don't have a campfire up here, so I have to use an extra best thing, which is, of course, uh, flicker nitrogen. So now the question is, what do you do with a very well frozen marshmallow? Now, some people have suggested I make s'mores. The problem is s'mores are supposed to be mushy, and this is no longer mushy, it's not crunchy. So now the question is, what do you do with crunchy marshmallows? It's not make lucky charms. I'm really not sure what those things are, but... Actually, if you don't mind, um, I do not have a chance to have lunch, so if you don't mind, um, I just kind of have this as a snack. <laughs> I'm sorry. I should not be smoking in front of you kids. <laughs> well, that was smoking, that was fogging. It's okay to fog. But wait a minute. Why do they eat the marshmallow? One of the things about marshmallows that most people don't realize is marshmallows, in fact, extremely good insulators. What insulators do is they don't transfer temperature all. That's usually how you insulate your house. You don't want to know how to cold from outside to the inside. Well, marshmallows almost as good as the insulation you have in your house. Don't go home and insulate your house with marshmallows. What kind of land? But a marshmallow is such a good insulator, it will not transfer the cold temperature to me well. Even just as cold as, as cold as the ice, I can take it out and eat it, and it will not give me a burn. Ice isn't near as good. It will transfer the cold temperature fast enough to give me a burn to be very painful. By the way, those that have seen the show before, I am sorry to say that that the SAT has told me I no longer can offer marshmallows at the end of the show. I do not know why they consider it a safety hazard, but they have deemed it a safety hazard and no longer allow me to do that, so sorry. Um, I thought I'm going to ask, why in the world do we use so much liquor nitrogen there from that? And I demonstrate that a couple of ways. First off, I have here an electromagnetic coil, and there's a law called Lenz's Law, L-E-N-Z, that any time you put an electrical conductor, like this aluminum ring, into a changing magnetic field, it produces a current in that conductor, and that current makes it a magnetic field opposite one thing. So when I activate the coil, Whoa. now that's good. So we in Fermi Lab just don't want new electrical current. We want great electrical. So I'm going to make this a better electrical current by doing this. By cryogenically freezing it, it will become a better electrical current. Oh, by the way, it's so cold, it gives goosebumps to a penguin. It's so cold, every picture it takes is a freeze frame. It's so cold, it gives... Oh, uh, no, I forgot. <laughs> it gives um, uh, frostbite to a polar bear. There we go. Okay. Now that my ring has been cooled down to bright giant temperature, it now has become a better electrical conductor. And when I put it back in the same magnetic field as before, it will produce a higher current. And in this case, look, go much higher. The reason it's going higher is because it's producing a higher current, and therefore, by the way, if I let this warm up a little bit, will it go higher or lower? Lower, the lower the conductor, the warmer it is. So you actually use a sort of an osmometer how high up it is to determine what temperature it's actually. If you could actually catch it. What do you? Oh, here, don't let me guys. Okay. So that's. And with that, uh, we're going to take um, you know a short break for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, you can put them in the uh, in the Q and A at the bottom of your screen. And while people are typing in their questions, um, I have one for you, Mr. Freeze. How did you become Mr. Freeze? 
Um, well, I have worked in cryogenics a very long time. I, before Fermilab, I actually worked in the aerospace industry and worked on a cryogenically cooled satellite called COBE. But um, I've always had an interest in the, the, the um, science in particular and the, the, through that satellite became very interested in cryogenics. And as I was working here at Fermilab, I, uh, there was a Mr. Freeze. I'm actually Mr. Freeze the third, technically the third person that does this kind of demonstration over the years. And um, because I was so interested and liked doing it so much, um, the education department asked if I would take it up as a, as a part of my work here. And when the Mr. Freeze the uh, second left Fermilab, and ever since then, I've been doing it. Uh, that was 23 years ago now. So I've been Mr. Freeze of Fermi Lab for 23 years. Great. Um, we have a question from Christian, who's seven years old. Is liquid helium colder than liquid nitrogen? Yes, it very much is uh, colder. Uh, liquid nitrogen is minus 320 degrees, as you saw on the thing, or minus 196 degrees Celsius. Uh, liquid helium is what well, is minus three uh, 207 269 degrees centigrade or minus 450 degrees fahrenheit so liquid helium is much colder and because helium is a much more rare resource it is much more expensive as a whole we have a question from uh, another question, what percentage of air is nitrogen? Uh, air is actually made of, kind of surprisingly, is actually made of four major gases. And I'll kind of pre preface this as kind of a little quiz. The first one obviously is liquid nitrogen, as you saw on the demonstration there. The second most abundant gas in the uh, atmosphere is oxygen. And that's 78% is, is nitrogen, 20% is oxygen. What is, do you think the third one is? Any question? Well, it's actually water. Water vapor makes up the third largest gas in the atmosphere, about 2% or thereabouts. The last one or thereabout is that there's lots of other smaller percentages of gases below that, about 1% of argon or carbon dioxide or several other gases. But the four major gases are nitrogen at 78, oxygen at 20, water at two, depending on the humidity of that day, and argon and carbon dioxide at one or less. So it's, uh, it's the four, those are the four major gases that are in the atmosphere. How do you use cryogenics at Fermi? Um, as, as the demonstrator did, we, we use it for the most part for cooling in the sense that Lots of materials, when they get cold, actually have behaved differently, better electrical conductors or better. Um, in the case of Fermilab, one of the main reasons we use liquid nitrogen so much is that it's kind of the cheap way to get co fairly cold easily. I.e., when we're using uh, superconductors, which we use a lot of at Fermilab, those materials have to be kept at very, very cold temperatures. Well. Because they're helium and helium is so expensive, we use nitrogen as the cheap way to get it very cold to start with. Then the helium only has to cool it down a little bit further down to actually become a superconductor that we can use in operation. The other area that we use a lot of cryogenics is now our detectors use liquid argon, which is of course another cryogen similar to the nitrogen, but much heavier and better for some detector purposes. And large detectors we're building here at Fermilab use liquid argon. In fact, some of the detectors are so big, they're going to use basically the whole world supply of argon for like a couple of years to actually fill the detector. It's that big of a detector, and we use so much argon to fill that detector. How did you touch liquid nitrogen with your bare hands, even though it was so cold from Dias um, 11? The uh, nitrogen, uh, because it is so cold, it's a, in, in that temperature, it's boiling, okay? So that means it's boiling and th that boiling causes a gas. So when I put it in my hand, it actually is not touching my hand. It's actually writing on a layer of gas. I can demonstrate that real quick, if I will. I have a, I 
have here some liquid nitrogen, of course. And I am going to, let me switch my video here to my tabletop one. And I'm gonna pour a little bit on the table. And as you can see, it runs across the table. And it's running across the table that way because it's not touching the table. The table's too hot for it to touch. So it's actually making a layer of gas, nitrogen gas, that it's riding on top of. And that layer prevents it from actually coming in contact. Same goes for my hand. The hand is so hot that it boils before it reaches the surface, preventing it from actually coming in contact with my hand. And therefore, I can actually hold it in my hand, even though it's not touching my hand because of the layer of gas. Awesome. Um, how close is liquid is, wait, how close is the temperature of liquid nitrogen to absolute zero? Okay. Uh, liquid nitrogen in Kelvin, which is our absolute temperature scale that we use here at Fermilab a lot and is used in science a lot, where uh, Kelvin is zero degrees is absolute zero. If you are at zero degrees Kelvin, you are at absolute zero. Now, liquid nitrogen is 77 degrees Kelvin. So it is 77 degrees above absolute zero. Those are in degrees Kelvin, which are actually the same as degrees Celsius, just shifted down to absolute zero scale. So the uh, 77 degrees Kelvin is about 160 degrees Fahrenheit difference from the actual uh, absolute zero to the liquid nitrogen temperature in Fahrenheit degrees. How many gloves have you destroyed? Oh, <laughs> um, I, uh, is, uh, I used to get them from Fermilab, the direct stock room that we have here at Fermilab. And it used to be that I would just go into the stock room here at Fermilab and buy up their supply almost on a regular basis. Now I order them outside because it's a little easier to just keep my own supply. Uh, basically go through a box of 48 gloves. So that's 96 separate individual gloves because I use right or left-handed depending on which demonstration I'm doing type thing. Um, I use one of those boxes uh, twice a year. So, uh, and I've done it for 20 some years. So uh, you can kind of do the math and come up with a large number of uh, gloves that I have destroyed in my lifetime. And we'll ask one last question uh, before we go back to the video. So we have time for the demos at the end. Um, how do you make liquid nitrogen? How do they make liquid nitrogen? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, the process is called adiabatic cooling. It's kind of a big term, but it's fairly straightforward. As a gas expands, it cools down. So if you take any gas, let's say air, and compress it, and then allow it to expand back up, it will cool down. It will uh, cool quite dramatically. Now, example of this you have at home is like a propane tank you use for your grill or something. If you use a propane tank, the gas that's inside, as it expands, cools down. So your tank will get frosty cold. Uh, aerosol can, the same effect. As you use it, it will cool down. Well, you take air, which is 78% nitrogen, cool it, compress it down really hard, and then allow it to expand out, it will cool down very dramatically. Well, you go through that process again, for the, and you compress it down and expand it back out, it cools some more. The industrial systems that actually do this process are very efficient, amazingly efficient. They actually only take three cycles through compression and expansion to convert the air into liquid. And then they separate out the different liquids, the oxygen, the nitrogen, the argons, the carbon dioxide, and sell them off. So their initial product is cheap, it's free, it's just the air. And what they get out is the product they sell to Fermilab and other industries like nitrogen or oxygen or carbon dioxide for different uses. Great, thank you. With that, we're gonna go back to our uh, video and then we'll, if there's some time at the end, we'll take some more questions. Food. All all foods will freeze at this temperature. Absolutely everything pretty much freezes at this temperature. I mean, there's a there's only a few things that do not actually freeze at this temperature. Uh, and certain foods are more interesting frozen than others. Um, I'll give you an example here. Uh, this is one of those demonstrations that uh, 
I don't often do, and the reason is because I just don't consider it a very practical demonstration. But it is the banana demonstration. <laughs> now, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you take a normal everyday banana. Now, some people actually cheat and they don't peel the banana first, but actually the inside of the banana is softer than the outside of the banana. Secondly, I was told I need to poop this banana. I don't know why, but that's not because I'm hungry. It's because I'm pooping the banana. So. Now, what I am making here is a frozen banana, and yes, you can buy a frozen banana at the store. It isn't like the ones at the store. Uh, a, it doesn't have any chocolate or nuts on it, so that's one strike against it. Uh, secondly, even though it is technically safe to eat, I mean, it's not chemically changed because of the cold temperatures, is not very safe to eat in another aspect. And I, oh, I almost forgot here, wait a minute. Oh, it's so called, let's see here. Um, it, uh, I forgot what I was going to do. Anyway, yeah, yeah, got good luck here. Okay, now a banana has been frozen. Uh, you can actually take the banana out. Now, this is where the reason I don't consider this a very practical idea. Is that see now this is much better to be used as say a uh, hammer uh, and I don't think many carpenters are out there going to be building houses with uh, frozen bananas so that's kind of a now uh, the reason like I said I don't consider it very practical because I don't think this is a good tool in the industry but there is something I came up with that's kind of along the same lines and it's related to something that happened in uh, uh, history a little bit ago um, how many of you remember hearing about the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster? Space Shuttle Challenger exploded shortly after launch, ruined all seven astronauts on the board. Everyone know why? Right there in my hand is exactly the reason why. This is a Viton only. The Viton is extremely strong. You mean are not strong enough to pull apart. So very flexible material. Stays flexible down to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Did you ever get to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit in Florida where they launched the shuttle? Oh, what happened there? Right next to the rocket engine that has this Viton O ring in it. There's a large cryogenic tank of oxygen and hydrogen used for rocket fuel. And on a very cold winter morning, that O-ring got in, uh, got cold enough that it changed from its flexible nature to something that's in fact much more brittle. The O-ring snapped when launched, causing the gas to escape called explosion to kill the astronauts. We call this our Fermi snake, eventually one of the line clothes there. But I said, that's such a strong material. What if I took a smaller piece of that material, which I have here, and now, in a bit of a reversible portion, we'll take my piece of icon and I think I have here. And now, the reason I think this is a far better idea than the banana hammer is that when the banana hammer warms up, what I have is banana mush. When this one, this is icon. Piece of icon warms up, and I'm going to help along my hands like my Fermi snake is starting to do there. This piece of icon will, in fact, regain its flexible nature. So now I have invented the rubber nail. I cannot build, figure out what I'm going to build with rubber nails. I don't want my house doing that. Seems like a bad idea. Somebody has suggested, you know, how about building a house in an earthquake zone? That works really well, of course. So the wind blows, and your house gets over sideways. That's really bad. Now, we in the Midwest or Texas could have fun with this idea, of course, if our house happened to get by a tornado, we could ride the storm out. <laughs> by the way, my one patent of life, I'll stick it out of that someday, so then we could have thousands of people anytime soon, that's for sure. Okay, uh, next one, I'm going to do a little experiment. I'm going to do a little background demonstration first. I can show me snakes out here. Uh, I have here, oops, a racquetball. You guys are on. A racquetball. A tennis ball, you can actually hear something quite unique in this setting if you listen carefully. Racquetball. Not that much. Tennis ball. That popping down here was actually thunder. thunder. How could that be thunder? What thunder is is a sonic boom caused by air expanding past the speed of sound. In case of the lightning bolt, it's a heat of the lightning bolt caused the air to expand faster. In this case, the claw of the tennis ball caused the nitrogen to expand faster. Same thing here. Carp, not much. Carpeting. That sound is in fact. Thunder caused by the nitrogen, the carpet makes the nitrogen expand for that. Now, I do this kind of a background demonstration, which is kind of interesting by itself. You ever wonder why certain sports don't catch on really big in certain parts of the world? This is a good example. Uh, Racquetball Alaska, not a good idea. Think about that, you're probably going to be sorry. Uh, the Alaska Open, uh, not one of those big tour events, so you'll set a certain out there anytime soon. 
It is. Now that's tennis ball. Uh, actually, in Alaska, they do not call it tennis. Do you know what they call it? Dodgeball. <laughs> and by that ball, you're out. You're going to Dr. Ross. We'll with that. But I do that. I have a background demonstration. And whenever you're doing a science experiment, what you're actually trying to do is answer a question. So in our case, our question is, what are things, oops, in that, what are things going to happen to this ball? Now, before you do your experiment, you come up with your hypothesis, your educated guess. In our case, we could look at similar examples. Uh, we did a balloon. What happened to the balloon? Collapsed and came back. We did a rack ball tennis ball. What happened to them? It got hard. So what's going to happen to this? It's going to collapse like the balloon. It'll get hard like rack ball tennis ball. How many say it's going to collapse like the balloon? How many say it's going to get hard like rack ball tennis ball? How many not voting in this election? Half of the area. So it was our experiment. Now, the reason why the balloon collapsed is the air inside the balloon collapsed. Does this ball have air inside of it? Yes, it does. Oh, it didn't collapse. It got hard like a right ball tennis ball. Okay. But what happened to the air inside that ball? Did it still collapse? Yes, it did. It had to because it got cold. It had to collapse. So now I have a hard middle exterior with a collapsed gas or a vacuum inside. What does that make this like? No, I'm not voting. I'm pointing to a light bulb. What oh, happened to light bulb when you hit them? They explode. The reason why that ball explodes that way because it is just like a light bulb. You hit it and it blows into a thousand pieces all over the place. Just like a light bulb. Okay. Okay, this next one. This next one is for you ladies. No, I'm not giving you flowers. But you ladies should know the connection between flowers and oops, flowers and cryogenics. And it's something about flowers as well. They smell like them. You smell those pretty flowers. You take flower base and rub on your cheeks. Give your rosy red cheeks. We talk about rose, right? But wait a second. Where do you get that pretty flowery smell? Perfume. So how do you get that pretty flowery smell in the perfume? They do it this way. By cryogenically freezing the flower. All the fragrance gets locked in the petals. Then the flowers can be taken out. The petals can be crushed. And the fragrance process can be perfume. Those flower-based perfumes use cryogenic to process the fragrance out of petals. Oh, by the way. It's as cold as the heart of a guy that would do that to a flower. <laughs> oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, I think... I think you're ready for this. Actually, if, um, if you don't mind, uh, I'm a little thirsty. If you don't mind, I'm going to have a drink of my pop here. Oh, you know what? My pop's warm. I don't like warm pop. Oh, oh, wait a second. Oh, I got this. Do you know what I can do? I can take and put some of my liquid nitrogen stuff right in my little thermos here. And then I will take, take my pop, put the cap on it. In just a couple of seconds, I will have, uh, this will be great, because it's only going to take a couple of seconds for that to get nice. This will be, so it's great. So, uh, well, um, the good news, my pop's cold. Oh, but now it's flat. I don't like pop pop either. By the way, if you're wondering what happened. At the point the pop reaches its freezing point, all the carbonation comes out of the liquid, causing it to come squirting out of the bottle. Like, hey, wait a second. Is that the reason why they call them fountain drinks? Okay. Uh, uh, let me explain what's going to happen here and what happened to that poor guy in front of them, I know. Basically, what he did is he took one of these little plastic bottles, he put something in nitrogen, put the cap on it, threw it in a trash can. Step back, wait for it to go off. And he waited. And he waited. He said, I must have done something wrong. So I looked at the trash can and see what's going on. 
That's when the bottle went off, hit him in the face. So he knows. What he did not realize is, A, how long it takes to be a Harper. Without any help, this bottle takes three minutes to develop our first one. When it goes off, it has over 250 PSI pressure. That's what this bottle is designed to withstand. When I try to figure out how to do this demonstration for schools, I can't wait three minutes to see if the bottle's going to go off. Then it comes with Solution's three minute problem. The solution is three minute problem is actually pretty straightforward, and I actually already showed you. Uh, what can I add to this bottle to make the nitrogen ball faster? Water. If you saw the Ziploc bag, this now makes the nitrogen ball so much faster. So now this bottle takes about 15 seconds. Now, 15 seconds of time to put it in the can and step back, but it's so long when it's actually going to go off. Now, a few things I need to advise you. First of all, that 15 seconds is only an approximation. I cannot count down 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and go off. I mean, these bottles aren't manufactured in a two drawer position. Secondly, when it goes off, it is extremely loud. So if you're as sensitive to loud noises, you want to put your hand through it. It's safely loud, but it is extremely loud. So, I need to be absolutely positive about just one thing, and that is, are you ready? Yeah! Now, that 15 seconds doesn't start until after I put the cap on the bottle, because the pressure starts building. So until that time, there is no hurry. It's not until I do this, this. Now I have 15 seconds, and I cannot stop it. <laughs> do I know? This is all that's left in that poor bottle that gave his life for this demonstration. As you see, it's all over. And on that exciting note, um, we're going to turn it back over to Mr. Freeze. Um, I did want to ask a quick question um, that was on our Facebook live feed. Um, what experiments do you work on at Fermi Lab? Um. Currently, I'm working on a, a, a test area that we work here at Fermilab. That is uh, a, a facility that allows us to bombard detectors with high energy particles to see how well they work before you actually build the full experiment. Because these experiments are big, expensive, you want to test them before you actually build them. And this facility allows us to do that. The other area that I actually work in is an area that we actually make a, a particular plastic. It's called scintillating plastic, and it's used in lots of detectors. It's basically used to detect particles passing through it, muons in particular. And in this case, I actually can show you just a few examples of the materials that we're making here. And I'm going to switch my video here, look over. And this material that is here, is see all these shapes? Here, these are scintillating plastic materials, and they're scintillating because when they are exposed to particles, or in this case, we'll be using a black light, they glow. They glow a beautiful blue color. Now, you see these little green pieces here? Those are fibers, fiber optics, that actually take that blue light, convert it to a yellow green light, and send it down the fiber. And those are sent off to the detectors that actually detect as a particle passes through there, it generates a light, it gets into the fiber, the fiber takes it out to the detectors. So we have a facility here at Fermilab, an extrusion machine that generates this plastic and extrudes it out in all these different shapes for different types of experiments. Triangles and rectangles and little tiny triangles and big ones with multiple holes. That's all used in our detectors here at Fermilab and is used very extensively in uh, the high energy physics as a whole. So that's one of the areas that I work in particular that uh, does that type of work here at Fermilab. So we'll switch my video back. There we go. 
That was cool. Um, is there anything um, else you wanted to show us or did you want okay. to take some more questions? Um, uh, really quick, uh, the, one of the areas, one of the things that I mentioned that is we used a lot of that connection. And I mentioned that some materials get very uh, lower in um, uh, current, the jumping ring, because it gets more conductive. It is a better conductor when it's cold. Well, the truth is we at Fermilab actually want to make certain conductors perfect, perfect electrical conductors. They're actually called superconductors. And superconductors are very particular that when they get to becoming superconductors, they actually pass electricity perfectly. They will actually have no resistance at all. And to show you an example of that, and it'll take me a second here to get over here. I have here a special track, and let me tip it up so you can kind of see it a little better there. There's a special track. And this track is actually made out of really powerful magnets. And I can demonstrate that by that. It's, it sticks to almost anything. Now, this material, because it's a magnet, I have in a little can here. And I will uh, set that up so you can see it. And let's see where you can see this a little better here. There we go. This, for, uh, this can has some superconducting material. Now, most superconductors actually only operate at minus 450 degrees Fahrenheit, or basically liquid helium temperatures. But a few of them are very special, and they actually act, operate at liquid nitrogen temperatures. Now, those materials we actually call high temperature superconductors, even though it's still minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. This material, when it gets cooled down to liquid nitrogen, will become a superconductor. And when you put a superconductor in a magnetic field, you get what is called the Meissner effect. And that is, it doesn't want to change its magnetic potential at all. So I'm going to start cooling it down by adding some liquid nitrogen to this can, like this. Now, it takes a little while for it to cool down. Uh, in the meantime, you can see the nitrogen dancing around up here, like that. But once this material gets fully to liquid nitrogen temperature, it will become a superconductor. And when you put a, put a superconductor in a magnet, it doesn't want to change its potential. It doesn't want to move closer or farther away. So that piece of cardboard is making a distance between it and the magnetic field that it will want to stay at. So in this case, once it gets fully cold, and it's almost there, it will want to stay no farther or no closer to this ring. So in this case, once we're there, I think we're not quite, almost there. Give me just a touch more nitrogen. There we go. Now, it will actually float on that magnetic field. There we go. Come on. Stay there. One, two, three. Get fully cold. Okay. This can, there we go. We'll want to float on that magnetic field. Oops. Come back here. Right. Give me a little more nitrogen. There we go. Okay. Since now it's fully cold, it will float on that magnetic field. And it'll go round and round this track. I don't know if you, how well you can see it there. Let me get a little better image there. We'll go round and round on this track because it's floating down that magnetic field. Now, if I show you this other camera view real quick, you'll see that there's a little bitty gap in between that car and that track. And that gap is maintained by the magnetic field of the, the, the superconductor that's inside there and the, the, the high magnetic field that it's riding on. So this is a demonstration of superconductors that we use here at Fermilab a lot and a demonstration of how they can actually produce this magnetic field called the Meissner effect in particular. So that is one of the areas of Fermilab that we use a lot of liquid nitrogen to make the initial cool so that we use the liquid helium then to generate the, the superconducting material that we have now. So let me go back to the other video. Dang it. Oops, sorry, I turned that one off. There we go. There we go. So that's one of the major uses of Fermilab, liquid nitrogen here at Fermilab is making superconductors like you see in this video here. Any more questions you have? Um, how did you get all of the different colors um, balloons into the one container? Uh, before the show, 
I actually load the, uh, the door with lots of balloons and they'll stay in there for however long I want to leave them in there because once you cool them down, they're going to stay collapsed like that. Once you take them out, the air that's inside the balloon will start to re-expand, re-inflate, and therefore return to its normal shape. It's just a matter of how many balloons I want to put in. In that container, you could put 10, 12, however many balloons you really wanted to put in to, as part of the demonstration. But I put in a few, a few of them to just make sure it has that effect of uh, pulling them out. Uh, do you come up with all the jokes yourself? Um, yes, I do. In fact, I've only, quite quite often in my show, I'll actually ask people if they, you know, if they come up with any good uh, cold jokes, let me know. I'm always interested in uh, expanding my repertoire as far as that goes. But yeah, it's it's always been a case of you know trying to think of uh, what is it, it's as cold as, and then trying to come up with the next line. It is a challenge at times trying to come up with something that's. Uh, both interesting and entertaining. Um, why is a gallon of liquid nitrogen only a dollar? Um, well, first of all, the natural resource is air, so it's free. And as I said, the, the systems that generate liquid air, liquid nitrogen, liquid oxygen, and so forth, are extremely efficient. So the industrial systems are amazingly efficient at being able to take air and convert it into a liquid quickly, efficiently, that can generate huge amounts of uh, liquid very quickly and therefore it becomes easy to produce and therefore not very expensive. The other part of that is that the truth is what they really want to get out of the air isn't the nitrogen. Liquid oxygen is much more value, much more the main commodity they're trying to produce. The, the industries, uh, uh, facilities that produce liquid nitrogen are, are more interested in producing the oxygen. And most of those facilities actually are located in your steel industry because the steel industry needs liquid oxygen to create steel. So there, the processing plant will be sitting right next door to a steel plant. They'll be churning out the oxygen, pumping it into the, the steel industry to make the steel and all that nitrogen they're producing, which is more than the oxygen produce because of the percentage in the air, they just sell it as a product that they, you know, they make a profit on it, but it isn't something that they're majorly trying to produce a profit on, it's the oxygen. Um, what is the material that the little car was made of? Ah, the, there's like three major uh, types that are what are called high temperature superconductors. Uh, this particular one is a barium uh, uh, ceramic material. And it is um, because of the way it's made, it is quite brittle. Um, it is not uh, something that can actually very easily survive many things. Um, here's a, a smaller piece of that material um, that's been broken. And it is quite fragile in the sense that if you drop that, it breaks into multiple pieces very easily. So it is, uh, it is not very useful for us to use like here at Fermilab for making superconducting uh, magnets because it is so fragile, you can't make a wire out of it. Now there's new technologies that are being used to make wired type of high temperature superconductors, but at this time, they're not commercially available or practical for us to use. In the future, I would say not very distant future actually, they will become a commodity and we here at Fermilab would very much like to be able to use this type of material, which is much cheaper and because it works at liquid nitrogen temperatures, not liquid helium temperatures, much better for us to use. And as a final question, as we close out our virtual Mr. Freeze show, um, anything you wanna share about Fermilab or your work that you're excited about that you want people to hear? Um, you know, I, I always, I get asked a lot you know, uh, why I am so excited about science. And I think, you know, I, I guess I, I say, say it this way. See, sometimes when I look out, I see things a little differently than say most other people do because I realize some of the background behind what I'm seeing. Example, when you look at a star, you're just seeing a star. I'm realizing that the light that is coming from that star may have traveled millions of years through billions and billions of miles to get to you. 
And then when it gets to you, what happens? It just gets absorbed by your eye. It actually dies in your eyes. Your mind perceives that as a star, but I see it as, wow, look at what is happening when you see a star, is your eye is stopping the light after traveling millions of miles and millions of years. So that's the reason why I am so excited about science. I'm always interested in developing new ideas or understanding more things as I go through life. So that is my take on science is that it's just so much wow. That was great. And thank you so much for being part of our virtual open house. It wouldn't be an open house without Mr. Freeze. So appreciate you taking this virtual virtually with us and also um you know everyone that joined us here and on facebook live um hope to see you at future events we still have events running through the end of the day tomorrow so check our um, facebook page um our twitter at fermilab ed and our website uh to see what else we have going so thank you so much uh jerry for being with us today i really appreciate it yeah, no problem i yep. enjoyed being a part of it yep have a great rest of the year afternoon everyone yep